now I want you to give it up for one of the most powerful voices in social justice in this country, Christopher Hayes. Wow. <laughs> Y'all are rowdy down here in Miami. Well, thank you. That was an extremely, extremely kind introduction. Thank you to Dan. Um, thank you to the Miami International Book Festival. Thank you to all of you Floridians who did stay in line. Nice work. Yeah, give yourselves a round of applause. So, um, there was this very fascinating debate that started about two weeks before the election. And it was a bizarre debate. It was a bizarre thing to pe for people who were covering the election to begin to occupy themselves with, but it was a debate nonetheless, and I will admit that even I got pulled into a little bit. It was a debate about the accuracy of the polls. I joked at one point that you know, maybe we should postpone the election for a week because it seems like we're really close to hashing out this poll argument. If we just had a little more time, we could figure out who's right about this. And this debate over the accuracy of the polls basically broke down in the following way. Um, on one side was essentially all of the outfits that were aggregating polling data. And all they were doing were, if there were five polls of Florida, pay attention because this is super complicated, <laughs> they would add all five up, divide by five, that would be the average. This was what Real Clear Politics was using, it's what Talking Points Memo Poll Tracker was using, it's what a whole variety of sites were using, and it was the basic analytic engine of a site called 538, run by a gentleman named Nate Silver. And, Nate did some other things in the model. It's a proprietary model. He'll sort of hint here and there what he does at the edges, but he's very clear that most of what the model does is just averaging this poll. And there emerged this massive backlash in the right-wing media against Nate Silver individually, including this column in the Washington Examiner basically calling him out for being uh, effeminate. And more broadly, there was this pushback about his model and about polling averages and basically this concerted effort to attack the underlying methodology of the pollsters that were producing results that showed reliably, consistently, stubbornly, and robustly that President Barack Obama had somewhere like a two to three point margin of victory. And conservatives decided that they did not like that answer. Now, before we start feeling weak, I'm not gonna presume the politics of the people in this audience, but based on the applause, I have an inkling. <laughs> um, so before, I'll speak for myself, before I as a, as a liberal start feeling too smug, let's, let's all cop to a certain basic human aspect to all of this. I remember with pathetic acuity being at my computer in 2004, in the comment sections of Daily Coast, looking for someone to tell me that the polls were wrong. That clearly John Kerry had some kind of secret lead that was being missed in the polling data. Because that's what I wanted to believe, and it's, it's a very basic human instinct, a profound, universal human instinct, that we seek out information that squares with our worldview. It's called confirmation bias, right? So I don't think there's anything particularly strange about the fact that headed down the stretch of an incredibly close election in which people had a tremendous amount of justified emotional investment on both sides, that people channeled that emotional investment into a search for data that would confirm what they wanted to hear. 
But what was strange was that essentially the conservative elites, the people who were channeling around hundreds of millions of dollars like Karl Rove, the people who are writing columns and appearing on Sunday shows like George Will, were going along with this, I think, in all genuineness. And we're writing columns saying Mitt Romney will win by 300 points, uh, 300 electoral votes. And you saw build up in the conservative media, in microcosm, something representative of a trend that's much, much, much broader, in which essentially an alternate empirical reality was created. And there, and there was tremendous energy, determination, and in some cases, a weird kind of bizarro version of intellectual rigor that was brought to bear on this project. People going through the crosstabs, looking at projections of polling models, looking at projections of turnouts, looking at the granular details of the so-called likely voter screens, which is what pollsters were using to distinguish between people that were registered voters and likely voters, which is itself kind of a guess, sort of guesswork, kind of an alchemical process. And all of this intellectual firepower and energy and determination was brought to bear on creating an alternate reality in which the polls and the polling averages were wrong and Mitt Romney was going to win. Now, here is what was so amazing about Tuesday night. Well, there's a lot of things that were amazing about Tuesday night. But one of the most amazing things was that it's just very rare in our political life that anything gets definitively adjudicated. I mean, people talk about the effect of the Affordable Care Act and will health care premiums keep going up and will doctors start to not take Medicare as the payments to doctors through Medicare, which is part of the payment reforms that are part of the Affordable Care Act, how that's going to play out. And what often happens in these debates is there's this very knotted tangle of first principles and philosophical commitments and contested empirical data, and those get all tangled up, and there is no just clear, definitive answer. And we just argue and argue and argue and argue like this kind of cable news version of Waiting for Godot. And Godot never shows up. But this was this one <laughs> place where all these people made, in print, predictions based on this alternative empirical reality that had been created. And then there was a definitive judgment that was rendered. And they were wrong. Now, I've, yes, yeah, you, you, you cheer. And yes, there was a certain amount of schadenfreude, yes. That's correct. You saw the word I was reaching for. Yes, there was a certain amount of schadenfreude in seeing that happen. But it brings us to, I think, an extremely profound question, an extremely important question, and a question that in some very deep sense is prior to and the foundation upon which rests all of our politics, all of our conversations in public life. And that is, how do we know what we know? We tend to think of a relationship between trust on the one hand and knowledge on the other as going something like this. I encounter you, we're working together at the, you know, in the back office and we chit chat over the water cooler. And you say all sorts of things and I match up those things you say with what's actually happened in the world, what you say in my knowledge, and over time I come to trust you or not, right? So you say, oh, I hear so-and-so is going to be fired. They just got into it with the boss, and two weeks later, so-and-so is fired. And you think, oh, this sort of knows what he's talking about. Or actually, the way you should sort this spreadsheet is this way, and you do that, and it works, and you come to trust this person because the knowledge you have and the knowledge you have about the world matches up with things they say. And in this sense, right, we think of the knowledge we have as being prior to trust. Right? We know some stuff about the world, we encounter you out there in the world, we see whether the things we know about the world match up with the things you say, and then we make a decision about whether or not to trust you. But this is a total inversion of how it actually works. 
in our day-to-day -day lives, in the way that we negotiate even the most intimate personal spheres, and in the way that we navigate public life, trust is prior to knowledge. We know things because we heard them from someone we trust. This fundamental problem confronts us everywhere. I take my car into the mechanic. The car is making a strange sound. I say, can you take a look? And he says, yes, it's going to cost $500. OK. I mean, I don't know. You go to a doctor. I mean, the, the relationship between patient and doctor is so fraught for precisely this reason, right? Why are you going to the doctor? You're going to the doctor because you trust the doctor, right? They have a specialized area of knowledge that's been accrued at great expense and great time and cost, and you are going to them to get their diagnosis and prognosis about your illness. And so in some sense, you kind of sublimate yourself to them, right? They're the expert. And yet at the same time, we all know doctors can be wrong. I mean, every year in America, dozens of people have the wrong limb amputated, right? Medical error costs tens of billions of dollars a year. So we know, at one level, we know doctors can be wrong. At another level, we are there putting ourselves in the doctor's care because we trust them. And this intimate experience of how we navigate the world and how we acquire knowledge is reflected in how we have public debate. So my odds are, and I'll, be, I'll just speak for myself, I didn't go through and do the math on the polls. I didn't average them myself. I just trusted the people who said they were averaging them were averaging them. And I'll be honest again, I actually didn't go through and litigate this whole question of whether the likely voter screens were right or not. I just trusted that this big group of people that had a lot of money riding on it, that the mass of the pollsters who seemed to be going one way and then a few outliers were here, I basically just trusted that big group of pollsters. But I wasn't doing something very different than the conservative at home who was reading conservative media and the people that he trusted who were telling him that Mitt Romney was gonna win. And all of my glee and schadenfreude and feelings of superiority in the final analysis do not look particularly earned. Because it wasn't that I was giving a ton more rigor to the thinking about this. What I was doing was trusting the right people, and he or she was trusting the wrong people. And the experience of this last decade that has resonated throughout our entire body politic that rumbles beneath every conversation we have is the experience of having trusted the wrong people. That the people in charge told us it was going to be one way and then it didn't turn out that way. And that experience represents something very profound, a real dislocation, a real rupture in the very way we come to find out about the world. We use these shortcuts. We have busy lives, and we are attending to children and loved ones and work and friends. And so when the time comes to figure out some matter of social policy, we just use a few basic shortcuts, a few heuristics. So we look for something that looks like consensus, right? That's what I did with the polling, right? There was a bunch of pollsters clustered here and a few outliers there. And I basically said, I'm going to go with the consensus on this. But of course, the consensus of, say, members of the United States Senate was that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. Right? Only 22 senators voted against that Iraq war resolution. And in fact, even those who were opposed to it seemed to concede that there was a weapons of mass destruction program. And in fact, if you went through the reporting from that era, if you were looking for consensus, the thing you would have found, the corollary and analogy to the mass of pollsters who were right this time about the race, was the mass of people and reporters and intelligence reporters and public officials and talk show hosts who said Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. That consensus was wrong. 
there was a consensus that the housing bubble would last forever. People said this. Lots of people said this. People with incredible amounts of institutional authority, like Alan Greenspan and Ben Bernanke, basically said the, the rise in housing prices over time is grounded in the fundamentals, and there's no reason to think that there's going to be some sort of abrupt pop. And that consensus is totally wrong. Another way that we look for information and knowledge is to look for proximity, closeness, right? The idea being, okay, you want to find out if Iran has a nuclear program. Well, you go to the intelligence reporters who have sources inside the CIA and not some random blogger who's just sifting through public information. Or you want to find out if the housing bubble is going to keep going, you go to the folks on Wall Street and not some random social critic who says the whole thing's a house of cards. And yet that method of fig figuring things out has been totally discredited as well. In some of the big crises of the last decade, those closest to the crisis who should have seen it coming the most were those cheering most loudly the onrush of catastrophe. And finally, when we think about how we should come to know the world, we rely most basically on just a basic assumption of good faith. Which is to say, we do not conduct ourselves in the world with the paranoid supposition that there is some engaged plot to deceive us. When you go and fill up your car at a gas station, you just assume that that meter is correct. You haven't checked it. And when you ask someone on the street for the time, you just assume they're not going to lie to you. But lots of people lost lots of money and had their lives ruined. There were deaths in the thousands produced by systematic deception. There was systematic deception around what the intelligence in Iraq actually said. There was absolutely systematic deception around the housing bubble. There was systematic deception coming out of Enron. There was systematic deception even in America's pastime of Major League Baseball. There was systematic deception being pulled off by the U.S. cycling team at a level of effort and detail that if you read the report from the U.S. Drug Doping Agency is exhausting even to read. No one has ever worked harder at cheating than Lance Armstrong did. It's true. I mean, it's really, it's like, it, it's just, it's like, you got to run essentially a criminal enterprise and train for the Tour de France at the same time. I am far too lazy <laughs> to ever cheat at that level. And so I think at the end of this decade, we find ourselves somewhat adrift. That whether we acknowledge it in a conscious fashion or not, we all now navigate the world of public life, the world of politics, the world of social policy, kind of having been burned and chastened and wary of who to trust and wary of whether when there is a front page article in the New York Times saying Iran does have a nuclear weapons program, what the hell we should make of that article. And this means that as we have undone the social consensus around some certain shared set of knowledge we all have because there is some communal meeting table we meet at at a society where we trust those experts who are sitting at that table, having undone that, having destroyed that, we now all retreat into these little private worlds of knowledge. And so you get the two, the two camps and their views of Poland. Or, at a much, 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 much more profound level, climate change. In fact, it is in its particulars almost identical to what we saw in the Poland situation, 
there is a small, very determined, and in this case, backed with a lot of money, group of people that have brought the full force of their energy, intellect, and dollars to bear on creating an alternate empirical reality in which either the world isn't warming or it's warming and humans aren't responsible or it's warming and humans might be responsible but there's nothing we can do about it. And the effect of what I call in this book the fail decade is to destroy the foundations upon which we might build the social consensus necessary to produce the level of social change necessary to literally stop the planet from melting. There's been some heartening polling data actually recently on um, the American public's belief in climate change and the American public's prioritization of that problem. Extreme weather events have had a pretty profound effect on people's perception of that. And I think that's, well, the extreme weather events are horrible. The fact that people are recognizing in the face of destructive extreme weather events that there is something happening here is, I think, a hopeful sign that we can do something. But over the course of the fail decade, we actually saw faith in climate science decline quite markedly. In fact, we move backwards in certain ways about the discussion. Do you know the last time that climate change was not mentioned in either of the presidential or vice presidential debates was 1984. There was a question about it in 1988 in which both Lloyd Benson and Dan Quayle said, yeah, we gotta do something about that. Dan Quayle. <laughs> it's not just climate scientists that have suffered a hit in the failed decade, in fact, the defining feature of American life at this moment. And I say this well aware that for most of the people in this room, Tuesday night was a great night, and it was a great night, and there's lots to celebrate. So I don't want to bum you out too much, see, feeling seeing some glum faces. But I do think it's important that we drill down beneath the surface of what our political divisions are and what our politics are to some of the stuff that's happening socially about how we actually relate to the society we've created and how that produces, I think, some of the crises we've had. And crisis has been the theme of the decade. At the end of this decade, well, back in the wake of Watergate, the General Social Survey, which is a longitudinal study over, over time of American public opinion, started asking people a question about which institutions in American life they had trust in. And the reason they were asking this question, the reason Gallup started asking a question years later and Pew has asked a similar question, was because, of course, in the wake of Watergate, there was a wide conversation in American life about what was experienced as a crisis of authority, that people no longer could trust the pillar institutions. And if you go back and you look at that data and it extends all the way back to 1973 and it comes to the present time, and if you go back and you look at that data from 1973, what you see is this, that in 1973, Americans' public trust in institutions considered at the moment a low watermark is in fact the high watermark. We live through now the period of time in which we have a low, the low watermark. Congress, the presidency, banks, labor unions, major corporations, medis the medical professions, education, the news media, have all suffered dramatic declines in the amount of people that report that they have a lot of trust in them. Congress is the least trusted institution in American life. It ranks below the popularity of the US going communist. It's true and Paris Hilton. In fact, Lawrence Lessig, who, who, who is a great scholar, uh, a legal scholar and kind of visionary around corruption and money in politics, makes the point that it is almost certainly the case that the British crown was more popular at the time of the revolution than the United States Congress is now. The only two institutions in American life that have seen their trustworthiness or the judgment of their trustworthiness increase during this period of time are police 
and the military. The military is the most trusted institution in American life, and Congress is the least trusted. And I, I dare venture that the founders who made Congress Article I cornerstone institution of the New Republic and explicitly warned against ever having a standing army would find it surprising to say the least to see that data. So then the question becomes, um, why do we have this crisis of authority? Why do we have this decline in trust? And I think there's basically two arguments about this. One of them says, you know, people are just, they want too much. They're spoiled, they're whiny. And this 24-hour news cycle constantly is exposing, is, is sort of constantly demystifying our public leaders, is constantly exposing their worst, most sort of behavior. We obviously have an example of that in the past week, right? I think it's perfectly plausible that in another era we would never hear about General Betraeus's extramarital affair. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that David Petraeus is not the first director of Central Intelligence to carry on an extramarital affair. <laughs> Call me crazy. So there is definitely something to that, right? I mean, were it not for the internet and Twitter, um, you know, we would not have seen Anthony Weiner's infamous crotch. And I think it's hard to make the argument that the Republic is any better off for having had the privilege. So there is something to this argument that basically locates our increasing distrust, our increasing skepticism, our disappointment and frustration in the nature and contours of a particularly toxic, aggressive, constant, ceaseless 24-hour news cycle. There's something to that. But I don't think that carries the full explanatory weight. Because I think Occam's razor suggests that the reason that people have less trust in their institutions over the last 10 years is that their institutions have shown themselves to be less trustworthy. We have actually gone through a period of time that began with 19 men with box cutters overcoming the most expensive security apparatus in the history of human civilization on the planet to carry off the worst mass murder in this country. And that was followed by the largest bankruptcy in history, which you're all looking at me with blank stares because it was Enron, which everyone's forgotten, because it's laughable to think about that petty little thing as the largest corporate bankruptcy in history because it has been since surpassed by the carnage of the financial crisis. And then we had the Iraq War, in which 5,000 Americans, 500,000, I can't say this number enough, 500,000 Iraqis, that's a number from a peer-reviewed estimate cluster survey that was published by John Hopkins University, 500,000 Iraqis, dead, 800 billion to a trillion dollars burned like oil fires in the desert. A major American city drowning live on national television while we all watched and a thousand deaths. And then the largest financial crisis in 70 years in which $8 trillion of wealth essentially evaporated overnight the highest levels of long-term unemployment in recorded history, declining median wages, stop me when I'm depressing you too much. <laughs> I could go on. I sound like Mitt Romney at the debates, actually. And that was, let's be honest, that was when Mitt Romney was at his most compelling. His best performances came when he simply rattled off a bunch of economic statistics, because it's been a really rough time. And so I think we have had this institutional crisis in the country. And I think the people that helm our institutions, the class of folks that helm our institutions, uh, are largely to blame. So I want to talk about who, who those people are. And I'll probably talk for about, you guys still with me? We're feeling good? OK, all right. I've been told on the last, on the last talk of the night, so. If you guys have like made really awesome dinner plans or something, let me know. We'll, we'll speed this up. But let's talk a little more, and then maybe we'll take some questions. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about elites. This book is called, I should probably mention the book, Twilight of the Elites, at a bookstore near you. Um, 
Um, I talk about elites in the book, and um, we have a elite and elites uh, who I think I think I think the decade that we've experienced is a, is a decade of institutional failure, and that institutional failure is largely a product of elite failure, which is the people that have been entrusted by society with helming these pillar institutions that have tremendous power and resources and incredible effect on our lives just collectively did a terrible job. A terrible job. And the word elite um, is an incredibly contested word in American public discourse. It's, it, I would say next to the word freedom, it's the most contested word. There is, um, the word is most often used on the right these days. And it is used to name, well, basically the people in this room. Like, if you're the kind of person that goes to a book festival, you are an elite. Right? There's this idea of membership in the elite, being part of the elite, is a product of a certain set of consumer preferences, lattes and Priuses and wine over beer and uh, seditious, this is Jeffrey Numberg, uh, linguist line, seditious taste in cheese and beverages. <laughs> and that's a very uh, common and pronounced view, and you see it all the time. And in fact, Sarah Palin uh, is sort of the, the most notorious figure in employing this kind of language. But it's employed everywhere. Rush Limbaugh will rail against the elites. Um, Sean Hannity rails against the elites. And that definition just is a complete break with the historical understanding of what that category connotes. There's a long literature of studies of elites. And in fact, the elite theorists, and some, on, on whose work I draw in parts of the book, of the 1915, 1910s and 20s, and even from the, the late 19th century, tend to be conservatives. There tend to be right-wing skeptics of democracy who are basically writing analyses of these newly formed democracies in Europe, hoping that there's a way to make sure that the right people still stay in charge. But the point is that throughout history, from the left and right, there was some basic consensus about what the word elite meant, who was in that category. And roughly, it is a relatively small group of people that exert a vastly disproportionate influence over society's direction. You can quibble about relatively small and where the cutoff should be. I think one of the useful things about Occupy Wall Street and this slogan of the 99% versus 1% was that it just gave a pretty good, rough, empirical approximation of where to draw that line. Because if you listen to the conservatives, you draw the line around the category of New York Times subscribers. Right? And that, that manages to capture both Henry Kissinger and my father, who's a bureaucrat for the Department of Health in East Harlem. Right? That category gets both Jamie Dimon and an adjunct professor of anthropology at Columbia University. So the 99% 1% formulation gives us a kind of better way of cleaving this. So we're actually talking about these folks that genuinely have disproportionate influence. And it separates these kind of cultural dispositions and affects from actual real power. You know, a kid in the Bronx who likes, and yes, nice, Bronx, right on. So a, a kid in the Bronx who's, who's living in, near Hunts Point in the projects who likes ballet and NPR is not a member of the elite. And Warren Buffett who loves cheeseburgers and drives a beat up old Oldsmobile is a member of the elite. The most striking fact about American political economy in the last 30 years is some trend I'm sure most of the people in this room are familiar with, which is the rise of inequality. Right? This is a familiar story that we've told. And in this book, I make an argument about that inequality that I think is hopefully novel and distinct from other arguments about inequality, because the way we tend to talk about inequality, particularly on the political left, is we talk about it 
as a violation of our principles of justice, as fundamentally unfair, as not right, as immoral. And I believe that. But the argument I'm making in the book is an argument that attempts to look at the growing inequality in this country and the ways that it malforms the elite and creates elite failure. Not that inequality is bad because it's unjust, though it is. Inequality is bad because it makes the people at the top worse. It's not about how inequality screws the people at the bottom, though it does. It's about how inequality creates very dangerous pathologies and dysfunctions in the people at the top. And the inspiration for that comes from a, a line from Desmond Tutu's autobiography. And it's, an, I think, a really important insight. And it's an insight that actually, in some ways, goes back to Hegel uh, when he writes about the master and the slave. Didn't think you were going to get a Hegel reference tonight, did you? Special bonus. <laughs> um, so, Des Desmond Tutu in his autobiography, No Future Without Forgiveness, is, is, is taking stock of the apartheid era in South Africa. And he says this. Even the supporters of apartheid were victim of the vicious system which they implemented and which they, import, they supported so enthusiastically. In the process of dehumanizing another, in inflicting untold harm and suffering, inexorably the perpetrator was being dehumanized as well. Inequality of the kind we have, of the acuteness that we have, of the intensity that we have, of the accelerating nature that we have, is bad for everybody, including the elites, because it makes them worse at carrying out the things that they are supposed to do. And it is bound to create crisis. One of the ways we see this manifest is in uh, in what I call in the book the cult of smartness. Um, trying to decide whether I'm going to open up another avenue of explanation. Let's not talk about the cult of smartness. Let's talk about meritocracy. That's what I'll. That, that's sort of where I'll, where I'll end up, and then I'll take some questions. How about that? In investigating, so the, the the kind of chain of this argument, right, is that we have this phenomenon, which is the crisis of authority. The crisis of authority is caused by institutional dysfunction, right? Institutional dysfunction is caused by elite failure. That elite failure itself is caused by this system of intense hierarchy and ever accelerating inequality. And the system of intense hierarchy and ever accelerating inequality is the product of a social system we have of elite production, of make, choosing who are the people who are going to be at the top of the pyramid, which we call the meritocracy. And so, for me, in the book, when you start up here and you drill down and down and down and down and down and down, you hit bedrock at this thing called the meritocracy. The meritocracy is something that even if the name is unfamiliar or we don't cite the name a lot in American life, it's everywhere. It shapes the way we think about everything. It is our shared civic religion. And it basically says this. It's a modernized version of a very old American dream. If you go back and you read de Tocqueville, right, he writes about how, and keep in mind, he's writing about white people here. It's sort of key, parenthetical. Not a lot of meritocracy or mobility for the slave. But for the free population of the colonies, he says, basically, what makes America distinct is that because they do not have the inheritance of feudalism, there is this kind of boundless social mobility. Because the old caste systems of Europe and the lordships and nobility and the, and the serfs never were here, there is this novel and exciting and productive, entrepreneurial, boundless, enthusiastic mobility. And it's true if you go back and you read history, say, of early New York, the merchant class of New York was actually made up by people who could not have been wealthy What's the word? Macher, since I'm down in Florida. 
in, in Europe, right? So we have this, this old idea that goes all the way back to the nation's founding, and the meritocracy is an updated version of that, and basically it says this. It says, we are not going to have an elite that is the product of this very narrow demographic group and this very small set of institutions, which is the former elite we have, which is the, 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 the Protestant establishment. Our elites won't just be white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant men from the Northeast who come through choke. What we're going to do is we're going to open it up, okay? Everybody gets a shot at being a member of that elite. And we will not deny entrance to the elite based on contingent features like geographic background, religious creed, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender. Everyone of all colors and all backgrounds and all genders will compete on the level playing field. And through this kind of tournament style process, this grand March Madness. We will winnow down to those people who are the hardest working and the most talented and the smartest and then they will run the big pillar institutions and everything's going to work out. And Barack Obama is an amazing testament to this vision and I say this as someone who, and people who have reviewed the book, some of the people to my left who have reviewed the book have really beaten me up for this. But I am someone who clearly has both, I am both a very, I am both a product of the system. I went to a magnet school that I write about in chapter two of this book that was a high stakes testing magnet school and I stood on a line when I was in sixth grade and I took a test among thousands of New York City kids to get into this school, right? And I was lucky enough to test well and I got this good education and blah, 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 blah. now I'm a cable news host. It's the American dream. There's a chapter in De Tocqueville about that, I think. So, so I'm, clearly, I'm clearly a product of this, and I, cl I have some affection for it, and I, I, you know, because they're part of this vision that is incredibly appealing, and Barack Obama, I think, embodies a lot about what it is appealing, because it is only under this system of elite formation in the history of the American Republic that that man with that background and that name of that color could be president of the United States. And it is a credit to the system that it did produce him. But I think the system has also produced a lot of cost, a lot of crisis, a lot of social distance. And I think that to, to return to my own high school, that what we have seen happen is that this meritocratic vision has kind of imploded on itself and it's yielded something that looks a lot more like oligarchy that this circulation of elites, this kind of grand tournament in which people are constantly competing and new people rise up and old people are cast down, isn't actually what's happened. The best way to predict the SAT score of a student is to look at their parents' income, by far. In the top, what was the statistic I just saw? I think it was that in the top 20 colleges in U.S. News World Report, only 9% of students come from the bottom third of the income distribution. What the meritocracy promises, what it says to us is, yes, we will have inequality. There are some people who are smarter and better than others. We should reward them. But along with that inequality, we're going to have tremendous social mobility. We will have not equality of outcome, right? We'll have vast inequalities of outcome, but we will have equality of opportunity. And what we have learned in running this experiment over the last generation is that inequality of outcome will destroy and subvert the means of producing inequality of, equality of opportunity. That the people who climb the ladder will pull the ladder up after them. That they will selectively lower it to their kin and relations and friends. That actually, during this period of time in which we have adopted a social model, what we have seen is that inequality has skyrocketed and social mil mobility has declined. You are less likely now to be born into the bottom fifth of the income distribution and end up in the top fifth in your lifetime than 20 years ago or 40 years ago. The society is becoming more class-bound and less mobile and more unequal all at the same time 
And this suggests to me that the social model that we've adopted, which has given us a promise that it won't do that, is a social model that is not working. I'll leave you with uh, a little parable about what this looks like in miniature, and then I'll take some questions. Um, the magnet school I went to is a place called Hunter College High School. It was the first public school for girls in New York City, actually, founded by a very visionary guy named Thomas Hunter, who is a real believer in women's education. Um, it's a really amazing place. Um, it takes kids from all five boroughs, and you take a test. To, to, to qualify to take the test, you have to get in the 90th percentile in your statewide test, so about 5,000 kids qualified to take the test, and then they let in about 220. Okay, so this is an extremely intense funnel. And the education I got there is amazing. I went there for six years. You, you take the test when you're in sixth grade, and you start in seventh grade, and you go through 12. Now, the only metric used to get people into the school is this one test, which at a certain level is kind of the, the most austere distillation of the meritocratic vision you can imagine, right? You can't give a new science library to the school and get your kid in, which you can do at some other places. <laughs> if Mayor Bloomberg's granddaughter takes the test and she doesn't get in, she doesn't get in. And at this point in American life, there's precious few places of which that could confidently be said. And so in that way, it kind of preserves in amber the core moral force and vision of the meritocracy. And yet, what has happened? What has happened is that in a city of massive inequality, in which those kids who are standing on the line in sixth, in, in sixth grade, 11 year olds, who are from Bed Stuy or Hunts Point or for the Upper West Side or from Tribeca or from Bro Brooklyn, there is no level playing field for them. We all know that, right? And on top of that, a test prep industry has emerged around the test. You can, for several thousand dollars, take a cram session for the week before, during winter break, to study for the test. You can hire tutors in the wealthier precincts of Manhattan at $100, $150 an hour to study for the test. And the kids that I talked to when I was reporting for the book tell me that more or less, at this point, everyone who gets in has had some sort of test prep. And there's no data we have on this, but that's, that's the sense that I got from reporting. And in the last 10 years, we have seen the percentage of black and Latino students, which was totally underrepresented and small to begin with, dwindle to a trickle to the point where the school is now letting in three, four, five black and Latino students in New York City, in a public institution. And no one made this happen. No one came in and rigged the playing field in any kind of intentional way. But this little parable shows you what happens in a society if you stop worrying about equality as equality, about equality of outcomes. If you stop worrying about why there are so many poor kids in our public schools, and instead worry about how you're going to get them to hit their performance benchmarks. This is the society you will produce. And it is a society right now that we are in the midst of producing unless we start to think very, very, very seriously and critically about some, or, some of our underlying assumptions. All right, thank you. All right, so let's do a few questions. From where I stand, I have found the experience of this decade radicalizing. And radicalizing in the sense of the original origin of the word, which is the roots, the roots of the problem. And that the roots of the problem seem to me to go much deeper than this or that party is occupying government. Although, that's a problem too. And so I would say, not that it takes cynicism, but it takes a kind of ridding oneself of a certain set of romantic ideals about how the system's working, about American exceptionalism. You know, America is the place, when they poll across all the nations in the OECD, where people give the highest responses to the question, is it possible to start at the bottom and work your way to the top? Right? We have the, we have the most people in America who say yes to that question. And we have basically the lowest level of actual social mobility. And that, to me, is this, this very in, intense tension and so 
I don't think I'm cynical and I don't want people to be cynical. I want them to be clear-eyed and then hopeful about the fact that the country has had way worse elites than the current one now and managed to dislodge them. I mean, you want to talk about a bad elite, the slaveholding plantation class of the antebellum South, that was a really bad elite. A really, really bad elite. And there's nothing like that. There's nothing remotely like that now. And so the obstacles we have are, in a historical context, I think, uh, surpassable. I think this issue of empiricism and, and the, the, the sort of nation being divided by empiricism um, it is a good one. And I think something that has become, um, I'm looking for a quote from Rush Limbaugh in here, so St steal yourselves. Um, so here's, here's an example of, of, of the attitude you're talking about, particularly on the right. This is Rush Limbaugh in 2010. He described government, academia, science, and media as making up what he called the four corners of deceit. Those institutions, he told his listeners, are now corrupt and exist by virtue of deceit. That's how they promulgate themselves. It is how they prosper. So think about what it would mean to dispatch the duties of citizenship, ignoring everything you heard from those four institutions. It would be impossible. So I think there's basically two things at work. I think there has been a very lucrative market created that people have flocked to for conservatives to, for conservative media barons to essentially um, offer their customers an alternate empirical universe. And so I think there is an asymmetry between the different parts of the ideological spectrum about the degree of susceptibility to this. Now, part of this also is the fact that, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about climate for a second, is that there's a huge amount of money invested in making this so. I mean, the fact that there is this massive denialist campaign on the right around climate change didn't just happen ex nihilo. It was produced by some of the wealthiest corporations in the history of human history, civilization, right? I mean, the, the current fossil fuel companies are the richest companies in the world. They're the richest companies the world has basically ever seen. And so there is a thumb on the scale. So there's been a failure of conservative elites. And I actually think when you ask about what will break that fever, what's been really fascinating is the debate amongst conservatives in the wake of the debacle, which was not the debacle that Romney lost. It was the debacle that everyone thought he would win because everyone believed what the conservative media were telling them, including, by all accounts, the Romney campaign, which is, which is, of all the things I learned about Mitt Romney on the campaign trail, that is the most devastating critique of the guy's management ability. I'm serious. Nothing I learned about Mitt Romney on the campaign trail was as worrying to me about what he would be like as president than the fact that apparently he and his brain trust of financial geniuses didn't understand the basics of the polling numbers. Again, add up five polls, divide by five. You know, there is no reason that the debate in this country between conservative and liberals is a debate about whether the planet is heating because of carbon emissions. Everywhere else in the world, there's debates about climate policy because there's lots of different things we can do and there's different judgments of what the long-term risks and costs are. But everywhere else in the world, with maybe a little bit the exception of Australia, whose conservative party is probably the closest to our own Republican party in terms of their Michigas, <laughs> is the, 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 the debate is basically what to do about this problem. And I am hopeful that we can get there in America um, if this kind of fever breaks and if the people who run basically the world of conservative politics decide that it is costing them too much in raw political power to be insulated so thoroughly from the actual facts of the matter to have such a 
anti-empirical disposition amongst not just their consumers, but actually their fellow conservative elites. I mean, I think that's what's so striking about the results of this election. One of the things I want to see is if they can mobilize on their side to suppress, we should be mobilizing on our side to expand the electorate, not just writing rear guard actions. And that means, and that means thinking outside of this narrow confines that we're in, right? When I turned 18, the Selective Service knew exactly where I lived, and they sent me a draft card. Now, you cannot tell me the government cannot find me on my 18th birthday and just automatically register me to vote. Yeah. So, we, I mean, we should have, we should be fighting on the other side. We shouldn't just be, now that we're out of this sort of narrow defensive thing, our mission should be expanding the franchise, expanding the electorate, making it easier for people to vote. People talk all the time about what's so, like, MSNBC is a fox to the left, and yada, yada, we're getting so uh, partisan, our media is so partisan in each media, but the benefit it confers is that I don't have that business reason that the, the worry about alienating my, my viewers to just call, call it like I see it, right? People are watching the show because they want me to do that. They're not watching the show because they think it's some place they can go to and not have their sensibilities offended. And the last thing I'll say is that there is way more appetite for the kind of work that we're doing, I think, on the show than you would think there would be or that people will tell you there is. Like, we do 40 minutes on financial regulatory reform, on monetary policy, on urban planning and urban gentrification, and we're, we're doing really well. <laughs> like, we are a successful television show. And, you know, I'm only gonna be able to host this show as long as that's the case. So that's not a trivial thing. <laughs> but there is genuinely a, I have been amazed and blown away in the year that we've done this show. We will sometimes do something and we will have a discussion that gets way off in the weeds and I come off set thinking, oh man, I don't know what those numbers are gonna look like. And sure enough, almost time after time after time, the numbers come in Tuesday morning, you know, we get them, we all get them emailed what our ratings are and I go right to that portion of the show where it got the most wonky and we didn't lose anyone. And that's a testament to, to, to an untapped resource of citizenship that I don't think our politics does a very good job of speaking to. Thank you very much, guys.